session of day two entitled Growing Resiliency Against World Hunger. I'm Philip Yan, your moderator and host. And for this conversation, I have the great pleasure of being joined by Baron Seeger, the CEO of World Food Program USA. And you can view his impressive CV in, in your packets. And like me, he's been at uh, World Food Program about two years, just when all the craziness of COVID-19 had, had started. And so as we contemplate the meaning of health in a global context, I can think of nothing more relevant to health than having enough food to eat. So in the time we have, uh, Baron and I are going to talk about the growing crisis in global hunger, driven in part by the pandemic, as we just said, over the last 18 months, but also for a long time by the forces of conflict and climate change. Um, in fact, there are at least three countries right now, South Sudan, Yemen, and Madagascar, um, in desperate need of food. They're, they're close to or in the midst of famine, the most severe and deadly form of food insecurity. In fact, 17 other countries are moving closer in that direction as well. And as many of you know, conflict is one of the biggest drivers of severe hunger. So it's no surprise that countries experiencing civil war like Yemen and South Sudan are in such catastrophic circumstances. But not, and that's because not only does conflict make it difficult for crops to be grown for food, uh, grown and for food and other aid to be delivered, parties to the conflict are using an age old tactic. And that's essentially using access to food as an actual weapon of war. Um, because the World Food Program has been one of the leading organizations to address this issue, conflict and hunger and getting food to people on the ground, it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Likewise, climate is proving to be a significant driver of hunger as well. The people of Madagascar, for example, have endured several consecutive years of unrelenting drought. In Central America, citizens are also facing dwindling food supplies because of global warming and arguably is one of the primary reasons many choose to make the torturous trip to up north to seek work in the United States. And we know that's been an issue. So Baron Cigar, welcome. Thanks, Philip. Uh, so glad to be here today. And uh, so thrilled to be uh, one of your panelists to talk about what's happening around the world today with food insecurity. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough, tough time in the world right now. We have a lot of people going hungry. Yeah, thanks so much for, for being with us. Um, so let's get started. I mean, global hunger is on the rise for the first time in a decade. And um, we were for a while seeing significant improvements, but conflict, climate change and COVID-19 COVID pandemic have clearly set us back. Can you tell us a little bit more about who we are and, and really what we should be worried about? So Philip, it's a, it's a really good place to start. What I would say is uh, uh, the, the place to be worried are the places where the UN World Food Program is focused. Uh, today, we have 811 million people who are hungry, don't know where their next meal is gonna come from. But the more alarming part of that is that 580,000 people are likely gonna face famine this year. Again, facing famine, that's something we haven't heard in a very long time. And you mentioned this in your opening, places like Ethiopia, Madagascar, South Sudan, and Yemen. And while a place like uh, in Afghanistan, a Yemen, a South Sudan, there's conflict, meaning there, there's wars are happening in these areas of the world. We have an area like Madagascar where there's not a war, but the worst drought in about 40 years. And where there's no water, there are no crops. When there are no crops, people go hungry. So it's a temporary, a situation in a, in a country like Madagascar, and these people need help. They need help from me, they need help from all of us. Um, and I would just say, having uh, visited refugee camps um, my entire life, um, I've seen time and time again, where people that are migrating, they're trying to seek safety. Food is always the first line of defense, but make no mistake, People are dying today because there is a lack of food. So our job at the World Food Program is to make sure that people are alive and there are short-term solutions. And then there are also long-term sustainability options to make sure that 
individuals won't have to rely on organizations like the World Food Program. So right now, let's let's step back a little bit. Why don't you talk to us a little bit more um, about you know because some people here are experts on you know on on food and 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 feeding uh, uh, the the hungry and being, um, uh, but others are not. And so, can you familiarize us with the mission of the United Nations World Food Program, and how does the World Food Program you how does World Food Program USA support that mission, or how are they related? I think that'd be good for us to understand in terms of process wise. It's a, it, by the way, it's a great question. So when you think about the, the United Nations World Food Program, one of the beauties of being a UN agency is that you're invited in by these countries to work. So you do have somewhat of an ambassadorial status. It gets you a seat at the table. The World Food Program has been in existence for 60 years. So think of us, think of us as the boots on the ground when you think about the World Food Program. The frontline healthcare, her, the frontline healthcare workers, 20,000 people, and many of them giving their lives up uh, to make sure that people are fed. We're combating global hunger. And today, the biggest challenge we have, the biggest challenge we've ever had in 60 years, we have 41 million people today, 41 million people on the verge of famine. And you said this in your opening comment, why? Conflict, COVID, climate. Uh, and we're very humbled by the fact that in 2020, the UN World Food Program was given the Nobel Peace Prize. So the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, recognizing the work that we do, by the way, with our partners on the ground, of which we have hundreds and hundreds of partners, uh, getting food to those that are in conflict because we deliver results. The UN World Food Program working in 88 different countries, uh, feeding 100 million people. Uh, that's a staggering amount of people, but I'm going to say uh, uh, 100 million people, but I'm going to talk about Esteli. So Esteli is a 30-year-old mom. I met Esteli two months ago. I went to Central America. You referenced this in your opening comments. Uh, Esteli has a 12-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. Um, Esteli's husband migrated and left her without any resources. Um, I asked Esteli, I said, how did you find the World Food Program. And she said, actually, you found me because the community knew who to call. So Esteli is the recipient of a $75 per month voucher that allows her to feed her family for more than an entire month. So the call- $75 allows her yes. to- Yes. Really? Yeah, we're talking $75 to feed, actually a family of four for an entire month. On average, because of our efficiencies, um, it costs about, 50 cents or less for any one meal. So when you think about the World Food Program, Philip, um, there are short-term emergency needs like Esteli. You know, when you think about uh, parts of the dry corridor, they were hit with two hurricanes, one after the other last year. Um, but they're still going through the dry season and people need help. So that's the short-term assistance. And then what I saw in Central America was the long-term recovery, working with the smallholder farmer training them how to do different seeds, how to do inventory, how to run a business, how to take their crops to the market. I was super excited about that because I saw where families were not migrating. They were given the resources, the training to provide uh, sustainability to survive on their own. So then you bring in the World Food Program USA. Think of us as the 501c3, the nonprofit arm the voice, if you will, in the United States. Our job is to support the mission of the UN World Food Program, to mobilize all the voices, the private sector, policymakers, businesses. And I'm very proud to say that we do it very efficiently. So the World Food Program USA, we just finished our fiscal year. Our efficiency ratio was over 90 cents on the dollar. So that means that more than 90 cents of every dollar went to support programs. My job as the CEO of the World Food Program is to make sure that everybody knows that we're the best investment, but that we save lives. We're here to make sure that those who do not have a voice have a voice through the UN World Food Program. So 
let's talk then about your greatest challenge or top priorities. I mean, we talk about countries. We talked about Yemen, Sudan, Madagascar. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned Afghanistan, which has been in the news and was something that most people wasn't on the radar screen until we had uh, until a few months ago. So we know that those are the geographical challenges. Are there others that we, are there others that you're worried about? But um, in addition to that, what are the challenges organizationally for you um, in terms of, you know, just getting the food to where it needs to go or even just getting the food? So uh, a couple things I would say. Um, one is that uh, when you think about the UN World Food Program, we're, we're collaborative. We work with lots of different organizations. One of the challenges with COVID is that, so when you think about the logistics piece of the World Food Program, on any given day, 5,600 trucks, 20 to 30 cargo ships, 100 planes in the air at any point in time. So we're, before COVID, we were just transporting food uh, and, uh, and inventory to help uh, local farmers. And today it's PPE, it's humanitarian workers, it's medevac. Um, it is uh, everything that uh, our UN sister organizations need us to transport. Uh, we have more logistics hubs to get to the right people. So um, it's, creating, it's creating a huge stress on our supply chain management because we're now the logistics backbone for a lot of the UN agencies. So that is a challenge uh, in itself. I would say not the number of people that are facing famine is, is really unprecedented. It's like, uh, it's like a category five hurricane that's all of a sudden heading to five or six different countries at the same time. Um, and we have to help all these people. But resources have been stable and not growing. Governments are having to take care of their own people. And so our funding from governments is, is uh, declining to stagnant. Uh, and by the way, we're very appreciative of everything governments are doing to support the World Food Program. But the need is, is significantly outstripping the, the funding that we have to support all the people in need. So uh, again, uh, a record number of people that are hungry, 811 million people, but uh, I'm hearing and I'm getting reports every single day about people who are dying because they don't have food and it's breaking my heart uh, because we can't reach them because we don't have the funding to reach them. Our capacities are stretched. Uh, costs are going up. Costs are going up in the U.S., but they're also going up for people in less developed countries. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, recently and it talked about uh, people that are cleaning and their, their full day of cleaning is they're earning 70 cents, uh, but 70 cents can barely buy a, a meal. So we're trying to feed as many people as we can with our supply chain management and uh, we're really stretched thin. So that, that is a huge burden. And you, know, you talked about um, you know, organizationally, the organization having to make decisions on, and it sounds really awful to say, but it's who lives and who dies? Yeah. Uh, because there's such a tremendous need and we cannot reach everybody. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out for you then, your top priority is, that, you know, have people who are on the verge of famine, and that's something that you want to try to, I would imagine, try to, uh, um, you know, try to relieve. Um, how much money are you are you talking about? How much do you need? How much food do you need? So uh, the, the number is, is literally in, in the billions. However, um, you know, we know that, again, going back to that $75 to feed a family of four. So to, to avert famine in itself is uh, right around $400 million. But the, the needs or the shortage for the World Food Program for the year is um, right around $6 billion. Um, we did the math and uh, we know that if the World Food Program went away tomorrow, that it's likely that 30 million people would perish. Uh, you mentioned Yemen and I'll tell you a, a true story. So I heard um, uh, our global executive director of the, of the UN World Food Program based in Rome and he talked about Yemen and the fact that we're feeding you know, 12 to 15 million people every single day in Yemen. And I literally had to go back and, and type how many people live in Yemen, because I didn't know the exact number. Well, there are 27 million people living in Yemen. We're keeping alive 
half of the population, more than half of the population of an entire country. So the, there's an incredible burden, but there's also an incredible efficiency that we're doing it for less than 50 cents a, a meal for every single person. So the funding is extraordinary. The investments uh, needed are extraordinary as well. But I would say that we're doing it. We averted famine, by the way, last year in many countries, but it is on the way. I think it is next to impossible to avert famine in the next year because we have so many people that are facing famine-like conditions. Again, Ethiopia, Madagascar, South Sudan, and Yemen, just to name a few, a few countries. We get reports every single day. And I think, unfortunately, it's just inevitable. We're gonna face famine in significant levels this year. So famine is your top priority here. Um, you know, when we think about, you know, it's such a huge problem, you know, just, just feeding the hungry generally, but famine in particular here. Um, we have, you know, people from the private sector, we have foundations. Um, how can the private sector, you know, and, and especially foundations, how can they help combat the hunger crisis? I mean, money is one thing, um, you know, and, and, and how can you focus philanthropy um, um, uh, investing in major social problems like, like global hunger? So there are a couple of things. One is, is just know their solutions. And uh, Philip, I was so glad you said it when you opened and that we've seen, we saw declines in hunger for 10 years and now we have a spike. Uh, I, I am hopeful that uh, when COVID is, is managed and people get vaccinated, that we will see um, hunger on the decline again. But there's solutions, solutions such as the World Food Program is feeding 17 million school children still, uh, even though the majority are not in school. We are reaching the most vulnerable people in war zones. You mentioned Afghanistan. We're feeding 5 million people in Afghanistan. Um, as hard as it is, because, because food is not a political issue. And we have to reach on all sides to make sure that, that, that food is not used as a weapon, that we are allowed to reach the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. We're pre, we are pre-positioning supplies in areas that are prone to natural disasters or conflict. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, coming back from, uh, from Central America, I was left very hopeful, by the way, because I met so many smallholder farmers that want to be sustainable, but they need resources, sometimes funding, sometimes it's technical assistance, sometimes it's just the, the, the know-how. And we engage the private sector at multiple levels, by the way. The private sector, I believe, are the innovators. Um, so sometimes it's a project that needs funding that is on the innovation side. We have an, an innovation accelerator looking at new ideas to provide sustainable solutions like h to grow which is how do you grow crops without soil? How do you grow them with the water? Um, and I'm incredibly humbled because the private sector stepped up to the plate last year and supported the World Food Program. Not to the levels, by the way, that are gonna solve malnutrition, but we're on the radar. We just have to get more engagement with the, with the private sector. The, the corporate sector, we used uh, an example, I would give you UPS, uh, not only with funding, but they also help us with our supply chain. They come in and they look at how can we be more efficient how can we reach more people with our supply chain? I happen to believe that the private sector, they're the innovators. Um, we work with a company called Palantir. Uh, they're helping us with artificial intelligence. It's allowing us to look at where people are migrating so that we can deliver the services and reaching the most at need people. So we are partnering with the private sector. Uh, we do a lot of work with foundations, whether it's the Conrad Hilton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, because they also drive us to make data-driven decisions. So philanthropy, the great thing about the World Food Program is that we do so much uh, that, that most people find a fit within the World Food Program, Food Program that fits their funding priorities. 
So, so Baron, we got a few more minutes, not that much time, but I want to, I want to leave. I mean, there's so much going on. There's so much, you know, when we get insight, it's sort of almost, it's almost overwhelming. There's so much that we actually have to do. But what I love about you is that I, I get the sense of optimism from you and what people actually want to hear you know, in the couple minutes that we have left is what can they actually do? That's what they're, they're searching for. And again, you have a lot of different people here listening at different levels. So give them, you know, let's, let's hear your optimism are, you know, what is it that they can do right now um, to, to, to be a part of this? Uh, so, your efforts. So, Phil, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I saw it literally a month or two ago. There are solutions out there to hunger. Um, and what we need, we need to engage everybody on the panel. We need to engage uh, everybody listening today. Come on this journey with us. Uh, let us engage you. Let us take you to the field. Let us show you the work that, that, that we're doing. Let us tap your knowledge around industry and, and the private sector. Um, you know, I, we want to build partnerships. This is not just about funding. We want to see how we can work together to solve hunger. I am convinced 100% that hunger is solvable. I've seen it with my own eyes. But I would also say there are a lot of people in the world that don't have a voice and they're relying on us to get it right. Um, and so I would just say I'm pleading with you. You know, I think the World Food Forum is the best organization to get involved with. We have 60 years of experience. We're doing it. We averted famine last year when we thought it was going to happen, but we can't do it without the engagement of the private sector. Okay, great. Unfortunately, we've, we've, we've run out of time. Um, many, many thanks to Baron Seeger, CEO of World Food Program USA. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will um, congr we'll meet all of you very soon in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.